Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kelly Hill, Executive Editor of RCR Wireless News. And uh, we have a real treat for you today on our webinar here on Private LTE. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. You are joining RCR Wireless News, which is the premier news source for, wireless, for the wireless communications industry. You can read us at rcrwireless.com. Your panelists today, um, I will be your moderator. We are joined by Alex Besson, who is founder and CEO of the Besson Group LLC. Eric Slurl, who is CEO of Ambra Solutions. Rob Schwartz, President and COO of PDV Wireless, and Joel Lindholm, who is Vice President of the LTE Business at Ruckus Networks and also happens to be co-chair of the CBRS Alliances in Building Working Group. So welcome to all of these gentlemen and we're looking forward to hearing from each of you. <coughs> Um, so just to get into a few items and recent private LTE news, uh, there's actually a lot going on in this space right now, particularly when it comes to the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS. Uh, the WIND Forum, which provides the technical specifications for CBRS, did, uh, finished up that work in February. CBRS Alliance uh, chose a brand and launched a certification program in May. The first six labs actually were named last week. Um, also, in, in, C, in the world of CBRS, uh, the city of San Francisco has been operating a CBRS trial this summer, two sites, um, working with companies including Nokia to test uh, smart city use cases. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Verizon has been testing CBRS in its live network, test site in Florida with indoor and outdoor uh, exploration there, and expects to have CBRS-enabled devices by the end of 2018. Um, also recently, DAS provider Zinwave said that it's going to be supporting a number of ongo private LTE pilot networks with Fortune 100 company customers. Uh, also, that's that's pretty much all coming from the CBRS ecosystem, but uh, that tends to be the one that uh, that we're, where we're seeing a lot of movement right now. So, a few key takeaways from our private LTE special editorial report, which will be published later today on rcrwirelessnews.com. Uh, that's a free download. So uh, with the maturity of the LTE ecosystem, enterprises and a number of verticals are trying to take advantage of LTE. Um, and private LTE lets them do it. It cannot, can be offered in a number of ways. Uh, most people seem to see the potential for network as a service uh, by carriers or third party, party providers. Um, the enterprise could possibly bring cellular expertise in-house if they were so inclined. Um, most of the folks that I talked to talked about LTE as sort of a middle ground between uh, enterprise class Wi-Fi and relying on commercial cellular networks or, or something like a DAS or other indoor uh, coverage for commercial networks. Um, the two primary options in the U.S. that are getting the most attention right now are multi-fire and CBRS. Um, there's always the option of making spectrum access arrangements with licensed holders, and we happen to have a couple of folks today who will be able to speak to that a little bit more uh, uh, in detail. Uh, use cases often center around um, supporting IoT adoption within verticals, and uh, our speakers will get more into that. Um, and then, but there's still a few regulatory issues that remain, um, at least in terms of CBRS, and, uh, and we'll also hear um, uh, about a couple of other options that are out there uh, pending FCC uh, changes. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Alex Besson, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about the overall ecosystem. Alex. Thank you, Kelly, for having me and for the invitation. Uh, I will start uh, first, uh, define the private LTE network. Uh, we define it as a dedicated network for consumers, businesses, and Internet of Things. Uh, private LTE network can be based on license, and license or shared spectrum. According to a research and markets report published in March 2018, the private LTE market will grow at a compound annual growth rate of approximately 30% between 2018 to 2021. That will be account around $5 billion uh, by at the end of 2021. LTE technology beca became much more economical to deploy for enterprises in many different industries due to the following key characteristics. That's my slide number three, please. Mobility, security, reliability, coverage, and low latency. The next slide, please. 
Uh, we expect private LT networks will play an important role for critical communications, industrial IoT, and enterprises across different vertical sectors. With the upcoming commercial commercialization of the CBRS band, private LT networks will support multiple use cases and deployments from education, healthcare, government, military, residential, office space, transportation, man manufacturing, hospitality, cable, mobile operators, energy, utilities, mining, oil, gas, hospitality, public venues, and public safety. Next, please. Uh, here's a snapshot of a private LTE network architecture for CBRS band. This architecture can be applied to general authorized access or priority access license. Uh, so uh, if you look at it, uh, there is no proxy here. Uh, EPC is connected directly to the CBSDs. Uh, if there's a proxy, the EPC will connect directly to the proxy. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a snapshot of uh, EPC architecture. Uh, uh, the key getaway here is a uh, serving getaway and then a packet as a network getaway is on the user plane, uh, mobility management entity, and the home subscriber service on the control plane. And depending on the enterprise assets, uh, we can split the MME in order to reduce backhaul costs. Uh, for example, cable operator can do that. Uh, they have all the fiber in their footprint, therefore they can save uh, their backhaul cost. Uh, Cable operators, they have also have power and rights of way to enable seamless connectivity. Uh, for, for virtual EPCs, enterprises, uh, we believe they need to have a switch in place as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so in uh, June of this year, uh, last month, uh, we just uh, uh, launched our a business case tool uh, for private LT networks for CBRS band. Uh, and we have interviewed uh, multiple vendors, uh, CBRS Alliance members, uh, industry analysts, and uh, so we have used some of the assumptions and inputs into our tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our tool is based on a five year forecast uh, and looking at it from the market size uh, in terms of uh, subscribers for outdoor coverage, and we look at the square foot for indoor coverage. And then uh, we have uh, CapEx inputs uh, looking at the power license fees, EPC cost. Uh, and then we look at the number of uh, EPC per subscriber or per small sales. And then on OPEX side, uh, we look at the SaaS pricing per small sale. Uh, you look at, again, the EPC, if it's hosted as a managed service or virtual base. We look at the hardware software maintenance cost, uh, utilities, backhaul, uh, EPC connectivity, network operations and management. Uh, and then we come up to uh, calculate total cost of ownership. Uh, so we look at uh, uh, on the square footage, uh, we took a sample of a 100,000 uh, square foot uh, building and we calculated the, the sample uh, you know, based on the input that we got. We got about uh, $1.70 uh, $1 per square foot. Uh, that's uh, equivalent to about $255 per subscriber basis. Uh, and then uh, that's for the indoor. And if you do an outdoor, uh, you took a, a subscriber number of 1 mi million, and then uh, we calculate the dollar per, uh, dollar per uh, total cost of a subscriber is about $161. Uh, so that's the, that's the key uh, takeaways from a business case tool. So uh, it is available on a license basis. We offer it to an individual or corporate license to enterprises looking at the calculation of a CBRS private LTE network. And that's all, thank you. Great, thank you, Alex, for that perspective on the market. And uh, now we're going to move over to Eric from Amber Solutions. Thanks a lot, Kelly. So quickly, just to introduce the company. So Amber Solution has been established in 2007. And since the beginning, we've been deploying carrier-grade network for industrial customers, having a lot of mission-critical traffic. So 
well, basically we have multiple offices uh, in Canada. We're starting in the US now. And, you know, to get Spectrum, uh, as you know, Spectrum is the key here. Getting Spectrum is always a challenge. Um, it's the same here in Canada. So we had to create our own MNO. So we have a company called Ecotel, which is basically a mobile network operator. So we're a member of GSMA. We own about uh, 6 million kilometers square of, uh, of Spectrum in various band. And then basically we've been leveraging that Spectrum mostly for commercial and industrial customer. So next. So basically what we've been doing and what we're doing actively right now is we do the engineering. So we do engineer deployed a multiple EPC core. We deploy as well all the voice components, so the IMS core, uh, we're using Volti. We're deploying 4G and 5G technology right now as we speak. And we do the, uh, the RF planning, uh, the DAS engineering. So we do both indoor and outdoor coverage for various kind of customer. And, and basically since we're MNO, well basically our customer, they become MVNO. So they have uh, their home SIM card. So the, the, our customer basically we're extending their network uh, and they have their own network, their own SIM card, their own voice, their own DID basically. So that's what we do. We've, we're deploying a lot of CAT M1 uh, infrastructure. We're starting the NBIoT shortly right now for sensors. So, and, and basically we've been providing a lot of application on top of LTE because LTE for us is an enabler and it opens the door to multiple applications can run, that can run on top of LTE. So like push to talk, tracking and so on. And we try to, to integrate as much as we can. And when it does not exist, well, we create uh, the component ourselves. So, so that's what we do. Next slide. So we're addressing various market uh, right now. Um, of course, oil mining, utilities, rail, uh, those are all market that we have customer in right now. And we're addressing more and more the other market. All of those vertical market are actively looking to use private LT for various reason. Uh, and, and you'll see later in the presentation. So next. So this is an important slide. Um, it is a lot of information to that slide. So I'll go through, uh, through this because a lot of people, they know very well the Wi-Fi technology, but not a lot of people know deeply the LTE technology. So here's a quick summary uh, and comparison, comparison of both technology. So on the left, you have the Wi-Fi, which uses unlicensed band, uh, 900, 2458, which in big countries or in big cities, I'm sorry, uh, can be subject to interference. Uh, on the, the right, you have the LTE technology, which is this license band. So there is no interference using those bands. So, so that's, especially when you want to do uh, some kind of mission critical traffic, uh, that's, that's important. You want to guarantee that you have a free channel to talk. Um, in terms of transmit power, uh, those regulations are different. Um, like here in Canada, the transmit power for Wi-Fi is 4 watt URIP, where depending on the band in LTE, we can transmit up to 3000 watt in remote, uh, in rural sites. So that's quite a big difference. But the big, big difference between Wi-Fi and LTE is the receive sensitivity. That way, that's what makes a big difference, meaning that in LTE, in, in, in Wi-Fi, you can have a decent throughput down to minus 85 dB. Whereas in LTE, we can have a pretty good throughput down to minus 115. So that's 30 dB difference. And that's huge, 30 dB. So, so basically, this is, this is why a cell phone in your pocket can get a range of, what, 5 to 10 miles away from a cell phone tower. It's not because a cell phone tower can actually broadcast uh, a powerful signal. And it's not because your cell phone is transmitting a high signal. It's because it can listen to really small signal, really weak signal. So basically the, to cover the same area, the LTE requires less infrastructure than Wi-Fi basically. So that's just how LTE technology and the receive sensitivity uh, keeps you. Of course, the Wi-Fi is based on what we all know, the 802.11 technology. It is based on the listen before talk. So basically, it's listening for a channel. If the channel is busy, it's just back off and wait for a random amount of time. However, what, what's happening is when you have a lot of users or a lot of throughput transferred, you'll see the latency will increase. The LTE is different. So the LTE has been designed right from the start to cover a large areas and a lot of devices, a lot of users. So it's actually a schedule base. So basically it's all GPS sync and you have resources block assigned to different devices. So that's why we, no matter how loaded is the, uh, the cell, the latency will always remain constant basically. Um, another difference is Wi-Fi uses TTD. So it's one channel for the upstream and the downstream. 
whereas the LTE supports both FDD and TDD. So FDD uses two different frequencies, one frequency for the upload, one frequency for the download. So it's kind of a full duplex channel. And it can also use TDD. Uh, and the upcoming technology basically will use a dynamic TDD ratio where you can actually adjust uh, the ratio for downlink and uplink on that same channel. In terms of mobility, uh, the Wi-Fi is a break before make uh, by that's how the technology was designed initially because it wasn't designed initially for mobility and then vendors they are providing some kind of mobility on top of Wi-Fi. Whereas the LTE can provide full mobility uh, to really high speed uh, the train or cars. In terms of QoS, that's really important because QoS is one of, is used more and more is needed for emission critical application. And LT is one of the few wireless protocol that can guarantee end-to-end -end QoS and also maximum bandwidth. Uh, you can define a maximum latency and a minimum bandwidth, basically. So we can skip to the next slides as we've covered a lot of information here. The use cases. So in all our deployment, we use basically a lot of features that are built into the LTE technology, LTE protocol, that are defined by 3GPP. Cell broadcast is a good example. For our customer, we're using cell broadcast to send warning messages uh, or any kind of warning uh, or evacuation can now be used, uh, can now use cell broadcast. Push to talk is an also use case. So we're using that same LTE infrastructure and we're migrating a lot of old VHF and UHF system into a that's a single rugged uh, and reliable LT infrastructure. We can do tracking, so we can track asset, we can track people now with LT. And in our case, we deployed a lot of system for remotely controlling equipment. So now we remotely control dozer, drill, truck over an LT network. So that's what we do right now. So it's been proven to be really efficient. Next. So of course, 5G is more and more popular. Um, 5G, as you know, there's two aspects of 5G. There's the IoT aspect, and there's the really high-speed portion of 5G. The IoT is already available as we speak, so all the equipment we're deploying is already 5G uh, ready. We're doing what we call, uh, we support the CAT M1 in the Nairobi IoT, so we can connect a lot of sensors, and those sensors can run in a battery that is good for 10 years, so it can report air temperature, uh, water quality, uh, any kind of uh, small data. Uh, so that, And we can now use what we call the eSIM, where an electronic SIM will be used instead of a plastic SIM. So that's for the 5G. Next. Well, basically, that was really in, uh, in five minutes what we're doing. And we see this as really the future right now for private LT. So I'll let the other speaker go ahead. OK. Great, thank you, Eric. And I do want to remind our audience: uh, please submit questions, either you know, on, on the topic on ge in general, or for or specifically for for our presenters, and we will get to those as soon as we get through all of the presentations. Um, so, with that, uh, Rob Schwartz of PDB Wireless. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks to RCR for hosting the call on this important topic. Um, I'm Rob Schwartz, President and Chief Operating Officer of PDB Wireless. And I'll take our five minutes to give you an overview of the company and, and really our, our key focus of using um, private broadband to solve enterprise and, and critical infrastructure needs. Uh, PDB is focused on enabling the private broadband solutions for critical infrastructure enterprise. And we're doing that leveraging um, what is really the largest nationwide 900 megahertz spectrum position in the U.S., which, which PDB owns and, owns and acquired. Um, we've started the company back in 2004 and it was founded by the founders of Nextel, Morgan O'Brien and Brian McCulley. And um, since that time, after acquiring the spectrum from Sprint and raising uh, capital and, and taking the company public, we filed a petition with the FCC to specifically take this ban, which historically was you know, over 30 years ago um, issued in the U.S. for narrowband communication, the way in which spectrum was allocated for uh, traditional LMR systems back then. And we're looking to repurpose or modernize that spectrum band as the largest license holder in that band to really solve the, the, the need for um, private enterprise broadband. And, and when we filed that years ago, several years ago, there wasn't really much knowledge of it. And we're happy to see um, the, the rising interest, um, both because of the rise of of the opportunity with CBRS and other bands, but obviously also because of the global ecosystem of LTE and the application of that technology um, for critical infrastructure and enterprise needs. So we can go to the next page, please. 
Um, our approach, PDB, is really starting at the at the top of this circle. Is starts with with the spectrum itself. Our 900 megahertz spectrum, as 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 RCR readers and listeners know, um, is really uh, best suited for cost effective coverage. A lot of the customers that we're talking and the needs we're addressing is about wide area cost effective coverage and and the foundation of as we know from all the original networks and, and carriers that were built is leveraging low band spectrum for that initial coverage layer. And that's what we see the 900 megahertz spectrum being is the foundation of, of any, any initial network for um, wide area coverage. Obviously there's complementary bands that we see as adding value. Um, and that, and so that, that our tool of 900 megahertz spectrum is just that it complements the other tools in the toolkit of other forms of connectivity, other bands, and even carrier services that complement the 900 megahertz band. Um, going counterclockwise to the left, talking about our ecosystem devices, the advantage of our 900 megahertz band is that it is um, band eight, uh, part of the 3GPB standard. And so it has uh, you know, thousands of sites deployed by carriers in Asia and Europe. And um, you know, per the latest GSE LT, GSA LTE, um, report, there's over 3,000 devices available for Band 8. So uh, unlike other um, evolutionary technologies that I've been a part of and, and, and the industry's been part of, now we're able to take advantage for private LTE, um, the economies of scale, the global standard of, of, of LTE and, and specifically Band 8 devices and, and uh, infrastructure that, that's readily available. The, the, the next um, circle here, the flexible service model, um, when we approach this market, and I think some of the segments were talked about it by prior, some of the prior speakers, um, we know that the the difference here, you know, the carriers do a phenomenal job in having been a carrier both at Nextel and elsewhere um, in addressing the, the 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 lion's share of the market opportunity and, and doing it in a, in a very good but broad brush way. Um, that does leave out the the emerging needs of private um, use cases, and so. For us, our approach to this is saying, not having a standard cookie cutter at all, but the relationship we have between us and the different customers can be anything from um, a pure um, spectrum lease, our ability to provide spectrum to the, to the customer and, and for them to have end-to-end -end ownership and control of the network, or to even go all the way to a managed service where we build, own, and manage a network uh, customized, uh, bespoke for their, for their needs. And so um, that's part of our, our focus is, is being able to have a flexible service model. Um, the next piece is commitment to innovation. And so for us, um, we really see that, that, that our spectrum, as I said, is the foundation of our, not just of, of the offering, but of our business model. And, and we're putting together really a, a group of partners, a, a, a robust group of um, an alliance between us and, and multi-vendors um, and we'll talk about that a little later, um, but also looking at um, the flexibility of the way in which the spectrum is being used. A, a good example of that, and really even the ecosystem case I talked about earlier, um, when we were approached earlier um, last year by, uh, by Google's project Loon, when they were trying to do restoration services in Puerto Rico, um, Band 8 was the, the band they designed that system for because it is a standard band in a lot of devices, but less utilized in, in, uh, in, in some of the target countries. And so off the shelf, they were able to launch the, the Google balloon system, you know, the, the balloons that, that float in the stratosphere remarkably. Um, but at the same time, existing US handsets that were in, in, in Puerto Rico were unlocked by the carriers and by Apple that allowed those, those devices to be used off the shelf and immediately to restore services for tens of thousands of of Puerto Ricans. And so that was a, a good example of sort of the innovation we see possible with, with new views and use cases, but also the existing ecosystem. And then lastly, um, the, the robust and scalable path to broadband. For us, a lot of our customers, our target customers, and I'll talk about one, one particular sector shortly, the utility sector, um, have existing private networks and numerous private networks, but they're usually what I would describe as disparate and legacy. Disparate meaning they're not really interconnected um, and, and often um, are legacy in that the technology is you know, getting near end of life cycle. And so a big part of what we do is, is help evaluate and determine the, 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 the life cycle and path of, of those systems being able to emerge and evolve onto a private LTE network. 
and really being able to measure the, the value, the, the, the cost of that consolidation when it's appropriate to occur, the value of the security enhancement, the reliability, the resilience, um, and really be able to solve new and emerging use cases, which in some of these industries are actually regulatory requirements for some of the customers. We can go to the next page, please. So uh, an example use case, um, you know, we see opportunities through, I think as one of the earlier speakers talked about, a, a lot of the different segments where there's applications of um, private LTE, um, but specifically com by coming at it with 900 megahertz, we're looking at those cases where, where the value of having broad coverage and cost-effective coverage um, is a critical piece of it. Um, so I want to highlight just as an example the utility use case for us, which is one of the we sort of describe as the bullseye opportunity for for our spectrum. Um, and a good example of this, you know, Southern Company, uh, they they have a wholly owned subsidiary, Southern Link, is really the only entity in the U.S. from a utility space that has deployed private LTE and and are in the midst of doing so um, in, with the assistance of Ericsson. And they're doing it um, because they they had the foresight to acquire the spectrum early on, but the rest of the industry and most other sectors that are now just really emerging to see the use case and opportunities to use private LT don't have the spectrum availability. And that's a big part of PDB's model is to enable those, those um, segments and users that don't have spectrum to be able to leverage off of the 900 megahertz spectrum that we have as a foundation for their, for their evolving networks. Um, and so utilities, um, have really been long-standing users of private networks. For example, they, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, I think, about the uh, evolution of LMR and push to talk uh, historical land mobile radio, and, and that's starting to get um, really become mission critical thanks to a lot of the evolution development on FirstNet. Um, a lot of the vendors are now offering good, robust, mission critical push to talk platforms um, to enable that to evolve onto, an, onto a consolidated LTE platform. Um, and then we also see SCADA, data networks historically, and even AMI, the, the automated meter reading platforms um, that allow for the, the, not just the collection of that data historically, but now for command and control of, of those, of those um, endpoints. And so all of those needs historically were done on private networks, they're disparate networks, and now there's an opportunity to really bring those together in a more robust and more powerful, um, with, solving additional use cases as, as they move forward. Um, so for, for anyone who wants more information on this particular sector, we actually sponsored a white paper recently that was published by Navigant. It's available on our website, on theirs, on our website, pdbwireless.com, or Navigant's website, um, which really goes into much more depth about the opportunity and the need for utilities and critical infrastructure. So the last slide, um, if we can move to that, is the opportunities to work with PDB. I know with this uh, intelligent audience of RCR, being a longtime RCR reader myself, um, we see a lot of opportunity as PDB enters this market, you know, different than we did you know, over 30 years ago when we built Nextel as really the first national provider in the U.S. Now we're really going at it saying we want to be an enabler for those customers that, that need private networks. And we know that we need to do that in an ecosystem of partners and, and alliances with, with partners. And so there's opportunities you know, across the board for us. We've, we've taken a multi-vendor approach. We've been working with both Ericsson and Nokia and doing that from an infrastructure standpoint, but really see an opportunity to um, bring in many partners across the, these, these different sectors to be able to um, provide a better solution and do so in a, in a, in a more cost-efficient way for customers. Thank you, Kelly. That's it for me. Great. Well, thank you, Rob. Um, we are going to wrap up our presentations by hearing from Joel Lindholm of Ruckus. Hey, thanks, Kelly, um, and thanks to RCR Wireless for the opportunity here. Um, so yeah, I'm Joel Lindholm, I'm Vice President of, of Open GLTE here at Ruckus, and I'll, I'll talk to you about a, a game-changing approach to LTE, um, and specifically around private LTE based on CBRS. So as, as Kelly had mentioned, it's a pretty hot topic in the industry right now, and uh, I'll hopefully give you a little idea why. So next slide. Just a little background on Ruckus. Um, most people will know us as um, uh, one of the premier Wi-Fi players, um, switching and also cloud-based networking. And as you can see here, just a, a, a few of the logos um, 
in terms of who's been relying on ruckus, who trusts ruckus. And we're just trying to take a sampling of people that are in smart cities and hospitality, you know, various different types of um, retail, restaurants, uh, you know, kind of corporate enterprise, uh, the federal government, and then large public venues. Uh, I chose this slide because it gives you a, a good range of people that have, I'll call it lower priority applications to people that have high priority applications, mission critical or high performance. Um, and, you know, as we've been a leader, you know, specifically in the Wi-Fi world through the 802.11ac uh, realm, um, you probably noticed the recent release yesterday on the, the new R730, the first um, uh, 802.11ax Wi-Fi access point that's coming forward. So we anticipate these verticals to be very strong in the Wi-Fi world and also be um, areas where we can start to work with them on CBRS as well. So next slide. I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about a major shift in, in industry dynamics. And these three buckets are, are areas which I think do a pretty good representation here. So if you look at wireless in general, um, you know, today, everywhere you go, you're dependent on Wi-Fi or cellular technology. Every device, every handheld, um, you know, IOT, everything is having a need for that. And it's not only applicable just in our day-to-day -day lives for our personal use, but also across the various different industry verticals. And I'll, I'll name a few of those um, in, in the near future here. Um, the next game-changing approach is, is Spectrum. Um, historically, Spectrum has been licensed by folks like AT&T, Verizon, and, and some of the other speakers on the, on the, the presentation here today. Um, a few years ago, the, the U.S. government got together with some industry leaders, um, including, including Ruckus as one of the founding members, to develop this um, new capability within CBRS. Um, it's a specific 3.5 gigahertz band that was used for the military out in the oceans just on a very narrow set of applications, yet they were tying up a whole 150 megahertz worth of spectrum. Uh, so the group got together and, and came up with a creative way of having sharing this spectrum and being able to bring it to users of all different types, whether it's residential, whether it's enterprise or industrial or operators. It really does open the door to a new model. And for enterprise customers, you, you'll really be able to consume it in two different ways. One is a tier called the general access tier which effectively means that if you have, if spectrum is available in your area of the 150 megahertz, then you'll be able to use it um, as you wish. Um, or they'll be able to buy a, a priority license, which is more like the license spectrum world, but in a smaller geographical area for some period of time. Uh, the FCC is deciding on their ruling on how that'll actually be used here in the near future. Um, but but the, the promise of this is taking a standard TDLTE technology that's been proven across you know, millions of devices and just innovating on how that spectrum is actually shared. Then the third innovation is what Ruckus is bringing to the table here. Um, as, a, as an enterprise and service provider oriented company, um, we understand what the needs are um, specifically around enterprise on how the packaging would need to be uh, handled so somebody like you could actually consume an LTE-based solution. Now, we call that portfolio OpenG. Next, please. So one of the, the, the biggest use cases is clearly in-building cellular coverage. I think most of us go into a building every day and, and run into one bar of cell coverage or maybe two. Sometimes there, there's, there's nothing there. Um, today, the, the licensed carriers um, rely on macro networks for outdoor coverage and hope that it penetrates inside the building. Uh, in some cases, in the various biggest of venues, they can put a distributed antenna system or, or small cells in, but that's a, a pretty big effort for all parties involved, whether it's the, the venue owner, 
some of them might operate those networks and, and the carriers themselves. So it's really limiting the, the uh, availability of that to just some of the bigger and higher priority venues. That doesn't help the rest of the venues, which are approximately 80% of the buildings out there. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is bring um, CBRS-based technology to all those venues in a very cost-effective way. So on the right-hand side of the slide here, you see that um, a DAS system, we did a, a five-year TCO on a couple hundred thousand square foot building, and you, know, you can see the numbers there. Um, a DAS would be $2.40 a square foot. Small cells would be, on an individual operator basis, would be $1.61. And we're bringing this LTE capability down into the 76 range, 76 cents per square foot versus Wi-Fi at 53. So you can see the, the, the capabilities now um, are gonna be much more cost effective and appropriate for venues of all different sizes. Next slide, please. So Ruckus has been at this for over three years uh, since the, again, the founding of the, the CBRS um, Alliance itself. Um, we've had been able to go and talk to a lot of different customers across a lot of different verticals. Uh, we've talked to people from uh, kind of a corporate enterprise mentality, I'll say. So, you know, some folks that might be in, you know, the commercial real estate or, or multi-dwelling or just multi-tenant, single-tenant type office buildings. Um, we've also talked to specific verticals inside where there's, you know, hospitality and healthcare, um, traditional verticals that Ruckus has been very, very strong in, um, as well as um, large venues that, um, like a sports stadium, you know, as an example, where we may put Wi-Fi in there today. Um, and they may have a DAS system, which they can um, use for some of the, the carriers, however they've negotiated those, those um, contracts. And then also in the industrial enterprise, I call it. So the you know, shipping yards, airports, mines, uh, utility companies, uh, shipping ports, uh, we've, so various logistic companies, they all have a, a need for, for wireless. And in some cases, Wi-Fi is great for them. We're a Wi-Fi vendor. We love selling them Wi-Fi. Um, but in other cases, that they have wireless needs that stretch just beyond what um, Wi-Fi can handle. And so that's where LTE comes into play. And we um, you know, can carry on a very good conversation with those folks. Um, next, please. So... Uh, through these discussions and various trials, we've done a number of trials. We have a no number of pending trials. There's a few different reasons that kind of bubble to the top, if you will, as to why these enterprises are needing LT and specifically CBRS. I talked a little bit about the indoor coverage that is starving people today. Um, the other part is, is an automation. Uh, if you're an airport, you can automate um, the the logistics around the aircraft and the maintenance of the aircraft and, and getting um, those back in the air. Um, if you're a shipping uh, port, you could have the container management. Um, if you're a facility, if you're an industrial, or I'm sorry, an enterprise type company that has a number of different facilities, you might automate some of the, um, the facilities management that could be done um, in, the, in the property. Uh, for things like security and privacy, um, I think it's it's probably pretty well known that um, LT is the is is probably the least able to be hacked network out there. The FBI uses that as a as the kind of calling card, um, and just the fact of um, LT itself and the way ad devices are added to it can give you an incremental level of security. Uh, from a safety perspective, um, you know, with the location intelligence, with the ability to add um, cameras for for various different environments, uh, comes to comes to the top. And then, lastly, the data and analytics. Um, today, in the LT world, if you you add a device to that network, it all of that traffic comes back to the carrier, and that carrier has has access to that data, not the the venue themselves. Um, here with CBRS and a private LT network, that that data and analytics is now available to the to the customer themselves. And my last slide. So, with uh, with as Ruckus, as I mentioned, we we understand enterprise customers. We understand how enterprise customers can consume and and where the 
frankly, the skill set is. Um, I think most people, if they think of LTE, they think of that coming from the carrier, um, whereas we're packaging this up so it can be brought to an enterprise like Wi-Fi. So as you can see on the slide here, we have you know, access points that we'll be selling. And we call them access points, not eNode Bs. So it does sound and, and act a lot like Wi-Fi. Um, they're powered by PoE, so our switching products you know, supply some great power to those, uh, those access points. And then we'll be packaging up a, a set of cloud services that, that allow you to operate and manage the network. So the EMS to manage the access points, the SAS, which is effectively the big database in the sky that tells where the spectrum is being used across the United States and whether you have rights to use it in that general access layer or in that priority access layer. And then lastly, the, the packet core services, which is what's needed to be able to add a device onto the network or control the network. And so we'll be packaging these things up. So that's a, a, a couple of piece of hardware for the access points, a switch, and then some license subscription licenses. Very, very easy to consumable. So hopefully that helps you understand how CBRS and it can enable you guys and how we can help bring it to you in a simple way. All right. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Joel. Appreciate that. All right. Okay, folks, we have a ton of questions from you guys and please uh, go ahead and, and if you have them, put, get them in now and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I do want to start off by going back to some of our panelists to ask a little bit about technical challenges for deploying private LTE. Uh, and Eric, I want to, I want to pose this to you because, uh, you you certainly had a chance to, uh, to 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 see it firsthand. You know, can you talk? Can you give us you know maybe two or three of the of the of the big ones in terms of operational challenges for for private LTE? Yeah, definitely. So well, of course, one of them we've we've covered is Spectrum. So so Spectrum, of course, when you go and you get Spectrum, the other challenges there are. Of course, as you know, the LTE core is something which is complex for most people that they haven't uh, used a core, right? The core is composed of multiple subcomponents, so we call the P-Gateway, the S-Gateway, the MME, the HSS. So basically, the challenge for a company that wants to start using LTE is to understand and see how it's going to integrate with their existing uh, infrastructure. Keep in mind that LTE is a layer 3 technology, it's not a layer 2 technology. So it's, we're, just, we're not just extending a, a flat VLAN, so we actually need to route over LTE. So there are some challenges like this that you must know before uh, deploying, or before uh, integrating an LTE network to your. So that, that's one of them. Uh, there's a few, there's a lot, but I just want to make sure that to provide short answers because I know you have a lot of questions. <laughs> we do. Uh, Rob, do you want to, to throw in something from your perspective on operational challenges for private uh, broadband? A absolutely. I think what we see, you know, taking from a customer centric standpoint, um, that the most of these customers, we take it for granted as, as RCR aficionados here that we understand these networks like the back of our hand, but most of the customers we're talking about don't operate wireless networks or at least don't operate mobile networks and so don't have a, a good understanding. So I think the threshold issue, technical and operational, is really a, a, having internal capabilities to evaluate and make the right decision. And that includes understanding the spectrum um, elements and obviously the, both the availability of spectrum, but also the characteristics of spectrum and, and, and the value of each of these tools in the toolkit. So where CBS CBRS is, is advantageous in serving, as I think Joel talked about earlier, um, but in other areas, you know, when you're trying to cover, cover broader, more rural areas, why there's a need for cost-effective coverage and what lower band spectrum can do, and honestly, how to get a hold of that spectrum. That's all new challenges for these kinds of customers, and, and I think it's a daunting challenge for a lot of them, so I think it's an opportunity also for a lot of companies to help act as advisors in guiding them through that process. Okay. And Joel, your thoughts on on operational challenges? Yeah, sure. Well, as as Rob mentioned, there you have to look at the, the particular spectrum, um, low band, mid band, um, upper band type spectrum for and use it for what it's what's it's intended to. Um, you know, three five propagation is going to be you know relatively limited, and it well it sits right between two point four and five where the unlicensed Wi Fi spectrum works. So. Um, so if you're thinking of CBRS and those kind of realms, then you're, you're probably in the right place uh, in general. Uh, the, the availability of spectrum is, is really meant to be simplified. So I, I had put those subscription services there. 
literally what you'll take is one of our access points. You'll plug it into the network. It'll send it its GPS location. It'll request the spectrum. And if it's available, the SAS will give them the spectrum. So it, it should be um, pretty well automated. And then again, just a set of cloud services to be able to run and operate the, the network. Um, we're intentionally you know, behind the scenes, you know, the P gateway, the S gateway, and the HSS, all, all of those components were we're hoping to um, keep keep that out of the worry of the enterprise customer because most of them are not going to be ex experts um, in in LTE, nor do they want to be experts in LTE. They want to be experts in their business, and so we're hoping the combination of the shared spectrum, access to the spectrum, and how we have it packaged to simplify it um, will will greatly ease the adoption. Okay, um, we had an audience question on. Uh, on security, um, and I thought that was an interesting one because that came up very frequently in the uh, in the discussions that I had with with various folks across the the ecosystem. So the question was, how do players position LTE versus Wi-Fi from a security perspective? Um, what I heard from people was, uh, you know, SIM based uh, authentication versus um, you know, just a, a password or, or, you know, specific uh, SSID access was one. Um, you know, uh, Joel, I don't know if, you, if as somebody who has, uh, who works for a company that does both Wi-Fi and LTE, if you can speak to any of uh, uh, that security aspect. Yeah, so the, uh, what you hit on is, is really the, the lowest hanging fruit. Um, the, it, it is SIM-based authentication. And in a private LT network, um, you, the customer, will explicitly add that device to the network. So you're intentionally saying, these are the people that I'm going to allow on my network and, uh, and only them. And so you can control the access um, versus in the Wi-Fi world, you know, various different methods of authentication. And, you know, the easiest is the passcode that's handed around to everybody that's out there. Um, the other piece of it is the encryption of the of the the network and at the protocol level. So you get encryption all the way to that, that endpoint. And so, um, so if you ha have your phone, right, all of you, you're talking into that phone, it's encrypted from your handset all the way through the network. So you're, you're inherently guaranteed a, an incremental level of security um, based on that. Um, we have use cases where people that security really means something to them you can imagine a bank or the or the federal um some of the dod doj type people that want to make sure that um that the traffic is kept locally at their venue that the device and handhelds are encrypted and that they're controlling what is on their network so it security plays a really big part um, for a variety of different reasons Okay. Uh, something to add, if you don't mind, also is getting access to an LTE transmitter is way more difficult than getting access to Wi-Fi transmitter. So, I mean, so if somebody wants first to either tap onto or do a man-in-the-middle attack, I mean, first of all, they need to have access to an LTE base station, which is something right now which is limited. Uh, so it's it's much more difficult to get access uh, to, a, to a to that kind of equipment. Okay. And and listen to yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Alex, I'm coming to you with this next one. Um, can you break down the total cost of ownership comparisons a little bit? Uh, you know, can you speak a little bit to TCO? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my last slide, uh, Kelly, uh, we did a comparison between outdoor uh, coverage as well as indoor coverage. So the only difference between those two on the CapEx line items uh, will be the small cells. Uh, but, uh, and they, are, they have a common denominator like installation, uh, switching, and network design. Uh, in terms of the OPEX, uh, you know, we have the SaaS service, the, we have the EPC service, we have the hardware, software, maintenance, and support. Uh, we have the network operations and management, uh, mobile network operator and EPC connectivity. Uh, utilities, a backhaul, uh, side rent that's applicable for outdoors, uh, interconnection and roaming. Uh, so that will give you your total OPEX. Uh, so that's the, basically, you know, you get all the uh, cost items uh, to calculate the private LT network there. Okay, okay. Um, anybody else want to uh, want to weigh in on that TCO uh, issue? Sure, sure. Um, I, I think I showed a slide that that we did a, a TCO analysis that compared, you know, just normalized in a five-year TCO across 
um, the different technologies that are enabling um, wireless, whether it be LTE or Wi-Fi. And uh, uh, today's model for LTE is really painful. I mean, anybody that's deployed a DAS, you know, has lived through the experience and having to bring each carrier on board of a DAS and how to, the type of cabling required, you know, throughout the venue, um, as well as the agreements to, to, that are needing to be put into place. It, it's, a, it, it's a fairly costly thing. Um, on, you know, what our deployment model is by using PoE, it's the same power over Ethernet network that you're using for your Wi-Fi today. So intentionally eliminating a, a lot of those costs and, and then just the coverage we get on the, the LTE radios is roughly three to four to one um, in terms of range that uh, a Wi-Fi one would be. So if you, you mix all that together, um, it, it starts to become you know, pretty advantageous in simplicity of deployment as well as the cost of deployment. Okay, great. Um, we did have a question about, will LTE or private LTE presumably be compatible with 5G networks? Uh, and that was actually one thing that I had a, a few different people bring up was the path uh, the path to evolution that private LTE uh, offers, in, in, and I believe CBRS was included in that uh, in that discussion as well. I don't know if anybody wants to to tackle that one. Uh, I can. This is Eric here. So all the equipment we're deploying right now, the hardware is all very five G ready. So so the the vendors, uh, it's a it's a matter of upgrading the software to be five uh, G ready. So when we're already doing some 5G uh, already with the IoT, uh, the core, will, uh, some of the component will require the core to be upgraded. But again, in terms of hardware, it's already available as we speak uh, for 5G. So, so for us, and the, the 5G, keep in mind that um, eventually all the band will be supported by 5G, a little bit like 4G has been initially started with a few bands and all the bands will be supported. It will be interesting to see about that specific CBRS band uh, the 5G ecosystem around it, but definitely uh, it should be fairly straightforward and easy to upgrade to 5G uh, later without replacing the whole system. Okay, um, we, did, we had another question. Which company on this call would be supplying the LTE core capabilities? Um, can any of you answer, you know, are you providing actual cores or are you, you know, sourcing those from, from core vendors, presumably? Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of the core there? The, uh, for us, we're using multiple core vendors. I don't want to put any to say any names today, but there are multiple core vendors. All of them are all virtualized now today. Like a core used to be racks of servers. Now it's all running over a KVM or ESX, and there's multiple of them, really good cores available off the shelf. But you need a core definitely. Uh, all the core, they're not all the same. Uh, some core vendors only provide some component. We've discussed about the MME, P Gateway, HSS, IMS. So those are really key component that are needed uh, to run an LTE network. And uh, so it's important to look at the core vendors to make sure which component are they providing. Are they providing all of them, only a subset of them? So you may need to come to have multiple suppliers in order to have a full core. So that's important to look for uh, when you choose a, a specific core vendor. Okay. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll be, I could ask on that to Kelly. So the, um, so from a ruckus perspective is yes, we'll be providing the, the packet core as a service, as I mentioned. And, uh, we, we actually have, um, our, our capabilities that we're building internally here that, um, again, to package it up very much like needed for white for, I'm um, sorry, for enterprise customers. You know, a lot of the, the cores that are out there are built for, um, for a mobile operator type scale, and, and the mobile operators clearly have their their cores as, as they need to, um, but bringing it down in terms of simplicity and cost and and the types of performance so that um, we can have um, the customers can use private LT networks and not have to be tied to a, a mobile operator. We've done a lot of work to to make sure that that's simple and cost effective for for the enterprise customers. Okay, and Rob, how is PDV handling this? Yeah, so you know, with our focus on mission critical customers, um, I think I absolutely agree with with what both speakers said. Alex talked about the you know the the plethora of vendors that are making cores available of all size and shapes, um, depending on the needs. But the the need for um, uh, the ability to have redundancy in those cores in a lot of cases is important. And so we we have an opportunity as PDV to be able to 
create that virtualized core as a, as a, as a service, really, to, to be able to provide that redundant need and, and also um, to be able to um, provide cost effectiveness in doing so because of the, the network of networks that we see that gets deployed in the space. Um, not everyone needs to own all of these elements themselves. There's an opportunity to share a lot of the infrastructure for both cost and, and, and resilience. Okay. Um, one other question, and that is, what role, if any, do you think traditional cellular operators are going to be playing in the private LTE space? Um, Alex, I'm wondering if you can, uh, can give us some perspective on that. Yes, uh, sure, Kelly. Uh, we believe that it, they can play a role of an integrator, you know, to uh, help those enterprises launch their uh, networks. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, the one thing they need to uh, pay closer attention to on the shared spectrum side is the li licensing, term, licensing terms, you know, on the PAL license. Uh, I think they will definitely go after the auction for the PAL licenses and then uh, the, once the, you know, the terms are satisfied, you know, hopefully they're long term, uh, so that they can invest in the, you know, building the networks. Uh, it will be extension of the corporate business, that's how we see it. You know, uh, that way the enterprise that can control their own user policies, their data caps, traffic management, quality of service. Okay, great. Um, Julie, you, Ruckus uh, has a mix of, of, you know, mostly enterprise customers, but also some uh, wireless carriers. Um, do you have any perspective on, on the role that they might be interested in in private LTE? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we're roughly, you know, I'll call it 70-30. So we've got a pretty healthy mix of, of, of enterprise and, and service provider customers. And uh, the if you're talking about a mobile operator versus a cable operator, both of those are, are prime entrances into the market. And, and one of the, I think the, the really, they're going to use it either for offload or to enter the LT market. Um, the, the byproduct of that, which is super, is the fact that they're going to drive the device ecosystem. Alex had mentioned earlier that Verizon's come out publicly and said that um, they'll start having handsets, shipping handsets by the end of this year, supporting band 48 CBRS, and, and they expect to aggressively pull the, move those out um, in the next year as well. So there's a ripple effect of the device ecosystem, and, and they do have a lot of access to those devices. So if, if, if I'm a, a mobile operator and providing a, an LT network, a private LT network based on CBRS, they, they certainly have the the LTE pedigree as well as the, you know, the devices that could be connected to it. Um, they, I guess the downside would be that from an enterprise perspective, then, you know, you're, you're still kind of tied to a carrier where it, it might be good to be independent in some cases. Okay. All right. Well, we've got time for one more question. And, and that question is, you know, what do you think of the, LTE, the private LTE ecosystem needs in order to become mainstream. A lot of these things are just getting off the ground or, you know, or, or uh, have been for, uh, around for a while but are, are really vertical specific. Um, you know, so is this going to be something that, that can become mainstream and what does it need? Or, you know, is it destined to be sort of a niche technology? Um, Rob, I'm going to start with you. Sure. And, and I think Kelly, it's a good follow-up question from the prior one because I think naturally, the technology clear is not niche. The technology is, um, you know, an evolution of the same technology being used by carriers globally, and and for us from a PDB standpoint, especially with, you know, with our Band Aid 900, um, the, so that the technology isn't isn't the the question. Clearly, there there are there are segments. I call them segments versus you know niche, uh, in which there's verticals, and these are large, very important critical infrastructure verticals where there are unique needs that can't necessarily be solved by existing carrier networks, but I think it's complementary to what the carriers are offering today. So we talked about the ability to, you know, whether it's sharing infrastructure, roaming, um, but enhancing the service that a carrier has in places where they either don't have coverage or can't provide the, the level of, of capabilities that are required. Um, I think it's a natural complement to, um, to what's being provided by those carriers. And I think it is gonna solve um, needs in these verticals that are, that are current and, and growing rapidly. When you look at the number of of devices, the proliferation we see in, 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 a, in an entity like, um, you know, Ameren, for example, utility in Missouri and, and Illinois. Um, and we filed with the FCC this year and were granted an experimental license and we're deploying um, a pilot this year where they've got, you know, what used to be 
probably thousands of devices and soon will be tens and tens of thousands of devices that have to be connected for them to have not just the right level of resiliency and control, but really from a regulatory standpoint, an obligation to provide a certain level of service. And that and those electric grids, just as an example segment, are changing rapidly in which there are there's new distributed architecture like solar and wind farms and batteries that change the dynamics of the way they need to communicate. And that communications layer becomes much more important. So it's a segment, but I wouldn't call it a niche because I think it's a pretty large and viable segment. Okay. Uh, Eric, your thoughts on on mainstream versus niche? So you're right. It was a niche uh, up to now because of the spectrum, uh, limited spectrum availability, as well as the complexity of the core. But now that spectrum is becoming more and more easy to have access to, the core getting simpler and simpler to deploy and operate. And again, keep in mind that the industry don't want to be locked with one operator. They want to have the ability to switch operator. They want to have a control of their infrastructure. So this is why we definitely see this as becoming mainstream really quickly. Uh, from all the requests we're getting worldwide, this is definitely something that will be mainstream. But you're right, it was niche before, and that time is over now. So. All right, Alex, your thoughts? Yes, uh, I think uh, <laughs> I agree with uh, Rob and, uh, and Joel. Uh, I think that uh, if, in order to have a mainstream, the interoperability between supplies are key, Kelly. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, we think it's important. And then uh, low cost of deployment and integration and the seamless mobility between small cells and to other networks are key, I think. Okay. Okay. And Joel, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I do think this is this is the, the, the right time and the right opportunity for private LTE to become can become mainstream. Um, you know, the but CBRS specifically, that's obviously the, the swim lane we're in. Um, 150 megahertz is, is a sea of spectrum that's available. And if you look at propagation, there's going to be a lot of spectrum available in, in any geographic location you know, to, to the enterprise's heart's content. Um, with the, so the availability spectrum checked off, the device ecosystem checked off with the mobile operators pushing this and the cable operators, and then the simplicity and, and packaging of the core and the, the products. I think it is actually a, a very good time to um, for private LTE to take off. Now we will take some time for the device ecosystem to expand on band 48. Um, however, it, it's clearly heading in that direction, you know, without question. So yeah, now's, now's the time to get started. Okay, great. Well, gentlemen, thank you all uh, to our participants. Thank you so much for joining us today. The slides will be available after the presentation, uh, so don't worry about that. And uh, thank you again for joining us, and thank you to all of our participants today.